Thanks again, everybody. Hi, everybody. My name is Dana Howard, and I am a member of the Center for Bioethics and the Philosophy Department at The Ohio State University. Uh, welcome to the Center for Ethics and Human Values Monthly Care Panel. Uh, the CARE panel aims to support Ohio State's shared values in the domain of research by building a community around discussions of research integrity. Um, and the CARE program is presented with support from the OSU Medical Center, uh, Center for Bioethics, and the Clinical and Translational Science Institute. And we are so happy to have all of you here today. Today, we're going to be talking about the ethics of research involving big data. Available data sets continue to grow in both size and complexity, resulting in new ethical concerns. And today we are going to be talking about all of the critical issues that involve making use of this data in a responsible way. We're lucky to be joined with the following panelists. We have Matthew Zook as our external panelist, um, who is the university research professor in geography. Um, at University of Kentucky, and he's also the managing editor of Big Data and Society. And then for our OSU panelists, we have Ryan Kennedy, professor in political science at Ohio State University, and Parvati Singh, assistant professor in epidemiology in the public health in the College of Public Health at Ohio State University. Thank you all for joining. So just to give you a sense of the overall structure, we'll start with um, Matthew who will be sort of giving um, a little bit of a lay of the land, introductory remarks about thinking about big data um, in research, how important it is, and also the challenges that we face making use of it responsibly. And then um, after those remarks, we'll have um, Parvati and then Ryan introduce your own work and um, the way in which you've been using big data and the ethical issues that and challenges that have come up in your own practice. And then I came up with a few sort of preliminary questions and we'll have about 25 to 30 minutes discussion about those questions. But um, for the participants who are joining us, we always have room for Q&A. So please throughout the whole presentation, if you have any questions at the bottom of your screen, you have the Q&A function start asking questions um, because that will really frame the conversation. Um, and so to no further ado, let's start with Matthew. Welcome. Thanks, let me see if I can share my screen again. Hopefully I can do it again. Uh, looks like it's there. All right, perfect. Uh, okay, so uh, the fact that you're responding to me means you can hear me too, so I'll just get going. Um, uh, anyway, thanks so much. I'm really happy to be part of this discussion. Um, said earlier, I'm one of one of my roles. I'm editor in chief uh, for Big Data and Society. This is an interdisciplinary uh, journal by Sage. Uh, lots of interesting stuff in here for this conversation. I'm going to do a shout out at the end for for some articles, uh, but mostly I want to sort of fake it, focus on sort of pro, uh, on uh, framing this. And let me start my timer so I don't go too long. Uh, always an occupational hazard with this. Um, so uh, first, I just want to talk about some of the big changes. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I think actually the other speakers uh, will probably be uh, have a lot to say on this as well. Uh, but we got new we we have new data sources. This is something that's sort of come out. Out in the past 15 years when we sort of had the first big data moment, um, really allowing us to change up how we uh, think about research projects in terms of scale and scope. We can look at narrow it down at very sort of individual level, but we can also take big, much bigger questions. Um, there's a lot of automation uh, possibilities. I think particular like pattern recognition is one of those things that uh, is, you know, really easy to do or a lot easier to do than sort of the time consuming processes that had we had pri uh, previously. And then generative AI, I'm not quite sure if that's a new research field. It's certainly a big thing that's around these days that's really built on the back of big data. Um, and then in terms of the possibilities, there's all lots of interest in predictive analytics. Uh, people talked a lot about uh, real-time responses. Um, my background is in city and regional planning, and that's something that uh, a lot of like sort of urban planners and urban governance uh, folks are thinking about. Personalization uh, can be uh, is also a big topic. Um, you probably see it most often in terms of marketing when we're using uh, websites and things like that. But we also see it in terms of healthcare applications, insurance, other sorts of things. 
Uh, there's a whole other elements of digital twins, these complex simulations that need big data to, to run. Uh, and then there's all kinds of ways that this data can be networked and, some, um, and really bring data sets together, which is both really promising, but also kind of problematic. Um, and I just thought I'd talk a, real briefly about some of my own work, just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. Again, I'm coming from, geogra uh, from a geography background, sort of planning background. So I'm really interested in spatial kinds of questions. Uh, this is a project I did, uh, I guess, over uh, 10 years ago at this point. And it was just simply looking at the availability of content in different languages. Uh, we were looking specifically across uh, Canada. So you can sort of see this this transition from predominantly English uh, web content uh, centered around Toronto, and then when you move or move into uh, Quebec around Montreal, you have more and more French content. Um, and that was simply an exercise to see um, the extent to which we could see these connections between the digital world and the, the uh, material world. Another project I've done a lot of work with is using uh, social media data, more specifically Twitter data. That's, well, for obvious reasons, well, maybe not so obvious. It stopped about a year ago when uh, Elon Musk turned uh, turned the API off for uh, for Twitter. That brings up some interesting questions. But, but this is actually looking at a uh, uh, number of tweets around Hurricane Sandy. And at the time, there was a construction crane that was damaged uh, during uh, by the hurricane, and we simply uh, were looking for tweets that were uh, sent at that time with the word crane in it. And that brought this really nice, you know, sort of locational kind of aspect to it. Um, I put these examples out because they're pretty simple to understand. They're pretty powerful uh, because now I'm going to start talking about all the problems with big data, particularly around ethics. So I just want to start out and say, like, I've done a lot of research. I see a lot of potential for it because now I'm going to really sort of get into uh, sort of the problem, problematic nature and some issues with it. Um, this is one of my favorite cartoons, you know, about after we use the, all the big data and solve all our problems, we'll go right away on magical flying unicorns, which I think is often what people uh, some, you know, that's sort of a mindset. We have this. We don't quite know how it works. Uh, but it's going to solve all our problems. But that's really unrealistic. Um, it's still super interesting, really important, uh, but also we have to think about it carefully. So I want to talk about thinking uh, about how we think about, you know, uh, you know, um, I, I use the word critical a lot coming from sort of critical uh, social science background. Uh, but really what it means is just thinking carefully about how we collect, use, and think about big data. And I'm going to cite, uh, I mean, cite a bunch of different articles in here, which I think at, at this point, they're sort of classic. This one by Dana Boyd uh, uh, and Crawford uh, 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 about, uh, I mean, Kate Crawford uh, about uh, critical questions for big data. Um, and there's all kinds of things. One of the big ones, you know, we keep on coming back to, and I've been doing this for 10 plus years, are issues of bias and representation. You know, especially if you're collecting something that's a non-standard data set, what are you actually collecting? What is being measured? Um, and that's really a key question. And we start, you know, sort of, you know, peeling back some of the layers of this. It comes, it comes out in all kinds of ways. Um, Ruha Benjamin's uh, work on racial bias in data is, I think, really foundational to this kind of thing. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, go into this. this. is a great book if you want to, you know, sort of get into it. She has a, a series of other books that have come out from this. Really great reading for all these kinds of topics. Um, but you can see sort of like some of the listings of sort of how racial bias uh, creeps into data. And again, we have to think about that the data that we're getting is it's when you get a spreadsheet or you get a, a data set, however form it comes, um, spreadsheet, I guess I'm dating myself uh, with that. Uh, uh, it, 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 it suggests that it's all sort of nicely ordered, it's all perfect, and it's and there's not a problem with it. Um, but in reality, that data was collected under who knows what kind of circumstances, if it's historical data, there's all kinds of assumptions and biases and issues that might come along with it that you have to keep in mind. Um, and sometimes it'd be kind of surprising. I mean, one of the things that I think, uh, particularly since, you know, thinking about sort of public health, sort of uh, medical kinds of things, uh, is environmental data. And there's some really interesting work out there. Uh, this is by uh, Dylan Mahmoudi and uh, his collaborators uh, out of Baltimore, uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore. Uh, focused on uh, crowdsourcing uh, air quality sensors. Um, and that's one of these sort of great projects that is also part of the big data movement. You have all kinds of, you know, people volunteering their data and sort of, you know, contributing, trying to, to make the world a better place. But then we start looking at where the, you know, certain things are located. Uh, you can see, and in this particular map, it might be a little complex, but essentially the 
orange, uh, the sort of orange suburb locations around Baltimore. These are tend to be whiter, uh, richer areas. Uh, and you can see by the little markers here, those little circles with the dots in it, that's where the majority of these sensors are located. So even though you're getting this great data, you know, looking at sort of air quality sensors and things like that, uh, it's spatially biased. You're going to get more of it in certain areas, less of it in other areas. And unless you think about that carefully, that can create uh, other sort of problems uh, later on, especially when we start doing analysis. Um, uh, Dana and Kate had a you know great other sort of set of uh, uh, of things in here. I'd highly recommend this uh, this uh, article uh, for you. It's relatively easy to. I mean, it's it's been cited a lot. Um, it's it's relatively old at this point, but it's the same sort of issues we keep on coming back to. Um, keeping you know data in context. Just because you can get data does not make it ethical. I have a feeling we'll probably talk about that a lot. Um, and increasingly, uh, we, we're seeing as in research that. You know, sometimes people will have better access than others. Um, I mean, it used to be if, you know, back in the sort of, I guess we'll call them the small data days, everyone sort of had more or less equal access to uh, resources from, you know, this, the, the state. That's where most of the data came from. Now, if you're inside a social media company or inside some sort of platform company, you have better access, more access to things, and that doesn't necessarily get shared. And you know the the incentives inside a for-profit profit company are very different uh, than from you know academic or sort of a public health kind of perspective as well. Um, so again, these topics are easy to uh, to ignore, uh, sort of try to sort of gloss over, but you really you know, don't want to sort of focus on that. Or uh, you do you do want to focus on that? Sorry, I've said the opposite of what I actually meant. Um, so I wanted to just sort of run down this other article that I did uh, with uh, uh, some of the same folks that were uh, just uh, in that previous article, talking about ten simple rules for uh, responsible big data research. Uh, this has been out for a while. Um, I took a look at it uh, this morning, and I I don't know if there's much I would change. I probably would say something more about AI um, at this point, just because of generative AI. We're having sort of its own sort of maybe it's at the new big data moment we're seeing right now. Um, but I want to walk through some of these rules. Uh, I'll put them all out here, uh, but some I think are sort of you know worth you know focusing in a bit more than others. Um, the first one is sort of this counterintuitive idea. I don't know if it's counterintuitive. Um, hopefully it's not counterintuitive, but essentially data are people. Uh, and we phrased it in a, that, that sort of awkward way uh, because we wanted to really take home that, you know, data is not data. They're generated by people. They're about people. Uh, and they really do sort of bring things, uh, you know, uh, really just to sort of bring that home, that it's not just sort of these, these rows and columns. Um, that uh, uh, that we're dealing with, but it's actually, you know, originating uh, originating from actual people, and that can come in all kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, ways. Um, you know, sometimes, and perhaps this is less uh, common, but I, I still see it from time to time. Unexpected sort of tidbits of data. Um, there, you know, photos. Uh, you can have all kinds of interesting data from uh, from location coordinates to you know the the uh, the type of camera being used. People have successfully determined heart rates from just looking at YouTube videos. Um, there's also this sort of shift from, from uh, individual to populations or community levels. Um, you can, you know, and this has all kinds of, you know, real important implications. You take sort of individual action, then it, then it gets applied to sort of a larger community, uh, you know, looking at um, you know, crime rates or recidivism, things like that. Zip codes often get used, uh, uh, you know, because it's a handy little sort of marker. But zip codes are also pretty are pretty well correlated with issues like, you know, race and income and things like that. So just because you don't have race or income in there doesn't mean you aren't bringing it in some other way, especially if you have some sort of some sort of, some sort of spatial data. A um, couple other, you know, sort of things along like that. But again really emphasizing that even if the data it looks sort of nice and perfect and you know sort of non non-human ultimately it does go back to human beings uh, in some some really sort of really sort of uh, personal and int intimate ways another thing I just want to sort of uh, 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 sort of point to is uh, careful being careful about re-identification of data I mean this is one of these things the, the whole open data movement is fantastic in terms of being able to replicate results. And things like that, 
but it also brings up new challenges because uh, sometimes it can be really easy to get someone's uh, you know de-anonymized data and then do a little work on it and realize it's actually you can identify uh, some people. Used to be there was some AOL, there was a big AOL. I guess it's, it's probably it's still out there. Uh, searches and basically people figured out that one of the things people do is they search for their name and so you once you figure out what person's you know name is associated with a search you can see all their other searches which is you know has huge sort of privacy implications um but there's, again there's a long history of this kind of stuff you know three three uh three variables birth date gender and zip code is you know really powerful those three things can really identify um you know a lot of people i forget the exact percentage i think it's about around 70 percent uh or something like that somewhere between 60 percent um it's really hard to anticipate what the harmless data is before you do it uh, again you know we have new techniques that uh, make the sort of back working uh working backwards um uh, and re-identifying data relatively straightforward um you know, things like, you know, network graphs or even Google's reverse image search. I mean, that's like that's a publicly available tool that's been around for, well, I don't know how long, a decade plus, uh, surely, uh, at this point. Um, and that's a really powerful way. So, again, you know, thinking about how we go about um, sort of uh, being careful about that sort of thing. Um, a couple other points. The, the last point I want to do just uh, uh, to my last closing uh, bit is like sort of start thinking about, you know, how do we approach this? What, you know, there are all these problems, you know, how do we like go about still use this data, but, you know, think about, um, you know, doing it well. And I would say today's event is a great example of exactly what should be going on. You know, have discussions about the tough ethical choices, you know, try to come up with a code of conduct uh, for your organization. This might be through human subjects or IRB, not necessarily, I will say, from my experience, it's sort of hit or miss depending on what institution you're at. Some institutions, you know, can be very sort of uh, uh, very careful about this, very thoughtful about it. Sometimes uh, I would probably argue a little too restrictive with some of the some of the things. Others are much more sort of well, whatever. It's it's publicly available data, uh, so you can do whatever you want. Though, you know, there's different sort of measures of public. Um, so, I mean, I would really, again, sort of push through, this is a recent article that came out in Big Data and Society, I just thought, you know, could be of interest to folks here, um, about, it's not about solving, you know, an ethical issue or coming up with sort of, this is okay, this is not okay. I mean, in a lot, in, in that ways, it very much sort of shares a lot of sort of similarities to the IRB process. Um, it's about opening up these conversations, you know, trying to, you um, you know, be critical rather than coming up with a sort of a sort of a checklist kind of thing. I mean, checklists lists have their place. They're really useful, but they also are sort of limited in the fact that if you just have a checkbox, you've met the criteria, you don't have to worry about it. I, I, I think it's really important that people worry about it well with this sorts of these things uh, uh, for a while, uh, because this is where you, you you take some time on this and you, you can prevent all kinds of, of problems uh, down uh, down the way. And I'm going to stop there because I'm at the end of my time. But thanks so much. Thank you so much, Matthew, for really opening up the conversation. <laughs> um, so Parvati, why don't we go to you next and you could um, introduce yourself, your work and the ethical issues and how you've been thinking about the use of large data sets. Thank you so much. Uh, that was such a great presentation, uh, Matthew. Uh, my name is Parvati Singh. I'm an assistant professor in the Division of Epidemiology at The Ohio State University. I study the impact of uh, ambient shocks like economic recessions, the COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. police killing of George Floyd, uh, the Dobbs decision, these kinds of uh, really big population level stressors on uh, various health outcomes, primarily mental health outcomes. And uh, I work a lot with big data from uh, mortality databases and electronic health records databases. And uh, in my work, especially when it comes to psychiatric epidemiology, the US doesn't have a robust mental health surveillance system. And that's why we go to, you know, uh, mortality estimates from suicide or substance use um, 
or electronic health records for emergency department visits, inpatient admissions, Medicaid claims, those kinds of data sets that include diagnostic or procedure codes pertaining to mental health. So that brings me to one of the first points that Matthew raised, uh, which I believe the first two points actually, which I believe are interconnected is accuracy and representativeness. When we're looking at diagnosis or hospital visit level data, who do they represent? They represent people who showed up and who in our opinion received an accurate diagnosis. Right there is a big challenge when we use big data for psychiatric epidemiology, right? Uh, we know, especially for those of us who want to study racial disparities or gender disparities. And um, I mean, there's so many papers out there that talk about how two people can present with the same symptoms, but can be diagnosed very differently, right? And that right there, I think, is a foundational aspect of big data, especially electronic health records uh, based uh, data that we have to be very cognizant about. Um, and like Matthew said, you know, this clarity of context matters. Uh, where are we getting more, let's say, which hospitals have a higher uh, proportion of visits by minority groups, right? Racial minorities, gender minorities. Uh, if we start digging deeper into, you know, these kinds of big data sets, uh, sometimes it can get really confusing uh, because ignoring the context of where those hospitals are, where those emergency department visits are, uh, can lead to extremely erroneous conclusions. So that is one aspect that I think big data research needs to really invest in. And as researchers, we need to keep an open mind about not just you know maintaining uh, you know uh, transparency in how we do the analysis, but also really thinking very carefully about who is in our data sets and are the variables that we are using capturing what we think they're using. These are essentially, I think, in any kind of research, are important values, but become even more so when we think about big data. I also want to talk about the point that Matthew raised, which is one of my uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about it is bias. Um, I'm not sure if people have seen, you know, so many documentaries and news reports of uh, bias in uh, AI uh, and bias in, uh, you know, um, facial recognition technologies, those kinds of things. But we also get bias in uh, uh, data when it comes to uh, other big data sources, especially I would like to give an example of uh, the mortality data sets that I use. So uh, for mental health research or other kinds of research, um, the vital statistics, birth and uh, uh, death data sets, uh, natality and mortality data sets, uh, it's so important to remember that the final coding of cause of death inherently may, is, is dependent on basically what a coroner says on a death certificate. That's it. Who is verifying that? And then that keeps getting compiled into state level and the national level and the longitudinal data sets. And uh, our comfort in using those and accepting that as the truth versus really interrogating at what levels could bias creep in. Just because we have a large volume of data, does it mean that the volume kind of supersedes its accuracy? Right. So for an ex uh, example of um, some of the causes of deaths that, that I study, suicide versus drug overdose, uh, depending on your population, one cause of death may carry more or less stigma than the other. And studies have shown that there are certain groups of the population in the US and in other countries that are more likely to be identified as having died by suicide versus a drug overdose or vice versa. And that race, gender, age, location plays an important role. So that's where these, the, the reliance on big data, like without forethought of, of these biases can lead us down the wrong path and probably even perpetuate existing biases within the system. Uh, I also really like Matthew's point on uh, data access and 
equity in data access and how incentives vary across the profit making sector versus academic sector. And more and more, we are seeing a collaboration between some of these sectors. But uh, what I see sometimes is that uh, using data that were not collected for research purposes in actual research can, can be problematic. Um, a very simple example that comes to my mind is the Nemesis data set. So that's a data set of all 911 calls in the US. Uh, and they don't have race data. Over 60% of the data points do not have race data. But if you look at like, I don't know, like the past five years, they do have volume. They have over 160 million observations by the cause of, you know, the ICD-10 or the diagnostic code for the 911 call. So those data were not collected for research. They are a monitoring surveillance, you know, uh, program for like uh, actionable sort of uh, policy making and and I guess process stream streamlining for emergency health services. So, so the, the, those, when we start using those data for our research, uh, it comes with those handicaps. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about that is always a concern. Uh, with data big or small, but particularly with the allure of big data uh, is um, the aspect of maintaining privacy. So it scares me all the time that when I look at national emergency health records or even state or county level emergency health records with the right combination of month, county, and the set of diagnosis codes that a patient receives, if someone was really intending to identify people, they could. So if I have an emergency department visit at Ohio State Medicine, uh, Wexner Medical Center, and I have, let's say, a fractured foot and um, alcohol poisoning, right? And maybe a couple other. And someone knows three out of the four diagnoses that I, that I had with the month and the county, they would be able to identify me with my race and my age and my gender. And so incorporating systems where people's privacy is protected and this regular auditing is done, you know, to make sure that we are not crossing those lines. Uh, the data that I use come with restrictions, which I think is great. I cannot report using vital statistics data or uh, electronic health records data uh, I cannot report less than 10 uh, observations in a given sort of month or county. So that limits identifiability, yes. Uh, but because in the past there have been certain circumstances where, you know, people have kind of misused these data, uh, I think building a system where it's clear to everybody involved that that's a line you do not cross for whatever reason ever and then have that audited uh, would not only build community trust in our practices, but also uh, encourage more collaboration because when I, let's say, want to collaborate with Dana, I wouldn't worry, you know, that inadvertently someone on Dana's team or my team might cross that line. So that is something that does worry me a lot. Yeah. Is, am I on time? That was great. Thank you okay. so much Thank for you those concerns and those examples. Um, Ryan, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm not sure how much more I am going to necessarily have that's new on this. Um, so I'm Ryan Candy. I'm a uh, professor in the political science department and also the Timoshev chair of data analytics. And um, yeah, I've, I've done research on uh, kind of a whole bunch of areas over the course of my career, um, but using a whole bunch of different kinds of data sets, uh, search data, satellite observation data, sensor data, um, all kinds of different, um, what we classify as, you know, big, the, the Twitter data set, of course, which everyone's used, et cetera. Um, and uh, there are a few things uh, right now, what I've been primarily working on is more in the area of artificial intelligence in our discussions about applications of artificial intelligence, ethics of artificial intelligence, et cetera. And of course, that's inherently tied with big data, you know, whether it be generative AI models, or even if we're talking about 
uh, things like facial recognition or older um, machine learning models, things that predict recidivism, um, whether or not somebody's going to be rehospitalized, all these kind of things rely upon the advances in big data. Um, I've also been doing some work on trust and ethics um, and blame when it comes to artificial intelligence and big data. And a few things that might be interesting, um, pretty robust finding. People tend to trust the results of studies that use big data more than they trust uh, studies that don't use big data, um, which in some ways is a little bit of a sophisticated idea, right? I mean, if we're thinking about in terms of experimental power, yes, more data is, is better. But on the other hand, when it seems to trade off and be more important as a heuristic than the actual like representativeness of that data, um, this can be a problem. Uh, we've also noticed that there are some interesting dynamics in terms of the blame that gets associated with use of big data and with um, use of AI systems. So, you know, eventually, what in many cases we're talking about here are things that we hope will end up being utilized and make things better in some way, shape, or form, right? You know, when Google Flu came out with its flu tracking system, the idea was that this was something that could be used to improve public health. Um, you know, the the compass system for all of the discussion about its shortcomings, uh, came out of a number of studies suggesting that bail hearings were not good at all in terms of releasing the people who were not likely to recidivate and keeping the people who were likely to recidivate in prison. Um, and so there was an idea that this would be use. And one of the concerns that comes with this is would public policymakers be able to avoid blame on themselves by simply pointing to a third party system and say, well, this is what happened. Um, in, indeed, there were even some legal scholars who suggested that it might be worse than that, that people who are making decisions in the public policy sphere might have an incentive to go along with the recommendations of a big data AI system um, pretty much no matter what, right? Because if they go along with it and they're wrong, they can spread the blame to the AI system. If they go along, if they don't go along with it and they're wrong, then suddenly it's double damning, right? Not only were you wrong, but there was a system that was telling you that you were wrong and you didn't listen to it. Um, surprisingly, we only like in our research on this, so we've done experiments with this and we've only really found this in specific circumstances. That's hugely circumstance dependent. On the one hand, when you have some distance, right? So somebody is like sending an AI agent out to do something and the AI agent messes it up, then there seems to be less blame placed on the person who sent it out uh, and more blame placed on the AI agent. Um, and particularly in the case of autonomous weapons, we found that there was a really interesting moral hazard in that field commanders might have an incentive to utilize uh, autonomous weapons in order to divert blame from themselves. While at the same time, if they do that and the AI system messes up, it reduces support for the overall mission. So you end up with this kind of moral hazard uh, between field commanders and overall operational. On the other hand, when um, people are part of the decision, so for example, a judge who's being advised by an, an AI system, we did not find a decrease in blame in this case. In fact, if anything, we actually seem to find a little bit of an increase. Um, and we were really surprised about this. We did a bunch of additional analyses on it. And what it seems to be is that people, um, if you make the decision with the AI system and it's wrong, then people seem to think that you are abdicating your judgment, mm -hmm. right, as the, the policymaker. And it's totally post a post hoc thing, but this is how people make decisions about these things, right? Is the, the decision is wrong, post hoc, a lot of people will say, well, obviously you should have known that. Versus when it's the opposite, when they disagree incorrectly, we find that, um, you know, the traditional idea that you would expect increases blame. But the, 
you, it kind of becomes a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Either way, you end up being judged more harshly in these cases. Um, but the reason why I bring this up is because there's a lot to be done here in terms of the ultimate ethical outcomes that occur here. I had a law school professor who came to me and said, you know, Compass may and these other um, programs may be biased, but we've got results suggesting that you could have the number of people in prison with no increase in crime if you utilize these risk assessment tools. If I go to a, he, his, this is his argument. If I go to a minority community and I say, this system is biased, but we don't think it's any more biased than the current system, and we will have the number of people in your community who are put in prison. He said, I think that's a trade-off people will accept. Um, so I told him, I'm not sure about that. And we actually ran a study uh, detailing this. And sure enough, it turns out that, yes, these net effects do have an impact on, on support among minority populations. But no, um, they will not accept a bias system, even if it has relatively large net impacts that might be positive uh, for their communities. So um, basically, this is my way of saying that uh, how these systems work and how they the results that they produce really shouldn't be separated as much as we kind of tend to do as scholars from what the end um, results and the end ethical questions in their practical application are going to be. Um, and I'll just go ahead and, and stop there and um, we can continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all three perspectives. And one thing that is really interesting is the sort of way in way you bring up the power, but also the ethical concerns and the issues throughout the whole life cycle of the data like use, right? So all the way from procurement and like the sort of genesis of how these data sets are created to how we analyze it and being really like critical as researchers to make sure that it's representative to the downstream like policy applications of it and the way in which we really need to, I love um, Matthew's idea that we need to be critical, like, um, but it's not necessarily going to be um, this sort of clear answer, yes or no, this is what we do in any given situation. It like actually requires more agency on the part of responsible researchers rather than the sort of allowing AI to make the decisions for us. So thank you so much for all of those preliminary remarks. It's like already so, there's so many questions that I have and there's already a lot of questions from participants. So I'm gonna start with about three questions and then we're gonna jump into some participants. But I do wanna ask one question that is a clarificatory question from the audience. Um, if anyone wants to like help me um, answer this. So what makes a data set big data? So we could start with that question as uh, along with um, the first sort of question that I was um, going to ask, which is sort of, the importance of data transparency, which is something that we hear a lot about, the importance of data transparency practices, right? And on your view, um, what do data transparency practices look like? And um, this is going to Matthew's sort of last point, like how do we ensure these practices are actually taken up by researchers? And in some ways this goes to um, Ryan's point, like, how do we make the public aware of the practices that are actually in place to protect um, their data, their privacy, and um, sort of the collective uh, possible guard against collective harms? Um, so I don't know who wants to go first, if there's someone, otherwise I can call on someone. Ryan, why don't you go first? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll take the the uh, what is big data question here, because it, it's actually it's a tough one. I mean, maybe, Matthew, I don't know, maybe uh, because it's in the title of your journal, you guys have a, a better one. But um, uh, well, I mean, I will say my my flip answer again, I'm showing my age here that it's it's big data is anything that doesn't fit in an Excel spreadsheet uh, or it's that. Um, but I, I mean, actually, the, the way we uh, 
or I and like within the journal, we tend to think about it. It's less about size per se. I mean, there's like the three V's and the velocity and variety and all those sorts of things, which I mean are useful. I don't want to, you know, you know, sort of say that, but I think in many ways at this point, it's more about, it's less about the size and more about sort of the effect and particularly, you know, is it, does it, it, it does it allow for a different way of doing things, I guess, is probably the easiest way of sort of saying it. I think that's a, a good way to think about a lot of times what you might consider big data or what gets considered data, big data might be better labeled non-traditional data. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is because what we oftentimes talk about, big data, I, I remember this from, and here I'm revealing my age, um, some of the works <laughs> in the in the 1980s for people who were doing really early text analysis and political science. Um, and they said that, you know, political scientists are kind of like the story of the sailors at sea at the mouth of the Amazon, where they water water everywhere, but nothing to drink. And it turns out that there's fresh water right over the side. Um, so big data tends to be about either the size of the data that makes it difficult to analyze. Um, it can be about the complexity of the data. So for example, text data is usually considered much more difficult to break down, video data, um, and it, it requires more uh, computational power um, and different approaches from traditional ones in order to analyze them. Um, it also can be about data management sometimes. You mentioned the velocity of data sets that you know, if it requires continuous updating, a lot of manual. So a lot of this really has to do with non-traditionality and difficulty of um, utilizing it within a traditional, what we might call a traditional framework. Mm -hmm. I can so, add a little bit yeah. to that from yes, the Parvati. epidemiology perspective. Yeah. Um, so when I think of big data, first of all, I think of gigabytes, nothing less than a gigabyte, a file. Um, second is, uh, at least the way I see it and in epidemiology, population level data that, mm. that have not been sampled. They're just for everybody in the population, this is the data that we have. And then third, echoing Ryan, like we can't use simple systems to analyze these data or even store these data. We have mm. to sort of look at more, you know, uh, fancier uh, methods of analysis, fancier methods of storage. So those three components if, if mm -hmm. a data set checks those three boxes, then for me, that's big data. Thank you. So the unwieldiness of the data set is <laughs> a marker of what makes it big data. Um, and so how should we think about data transparency given this sort of idea of um, big data? Yeah, this is another tough one. Um, I'm also on an editorial board for a journal where we require people to um, upload their data sets and their code for uh, reproducing it uh, and the results. And this is uh, something that we struggle with, right? Um, on the one hand, you know, one of the most effective tools that we have in order to help science progress and to ensure we don't have scientific fraud is people posting these replication materials. But in the case of a lot of these larger data files, you can have, you know, sensitive privacy issues, you can have data sensitivity issues. And in a lot of cases, also uh, the companies which, so, uh, there was a group out of Oxford that labeled this data exhaust, right? This is not data that was designed for research. It's designed for and usually collected for something else. And then it, it, we find ways to use it in research. Um, but a, a number of companies don't necessarily want that data coming out. So then the question becomes, can somebody utilize that data, produce something useful for science and society, and then not be able to share that data? Like, what do you do in that situation? Do they have to incur? Anyway, um, Matthew, I'm sure you've dealt with this as well. And uh, Parvati, I'm sure you've had some, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, I mean, this transparency, because I mean, the, again, this sort of the open data data movement or the, the like resharing for like repl replication. And, you know, I, there's like, you know, a couple of problems. One is just like we was, Pravardi was talking about, it's just sort of the size, the awkwardness. Even if you wanted to share, you have to like sort of a confront, like, okay, how do you go about sharing it? Then there's a sort of like the sensitivity, because if it's at, if it's at the individual level, um, you're, 
<clears throat> yeah, you, you, you risk sort of individual privacy. There's also issues of like, if, if it's coming from like some sort of platform like social media or something else, there's also the terms of service. You, you might not be allowed to share it, or if you're doing work within the con confines of a company, uh, you're not going to be uh, aware, and I'm sure we've all we've all been on the the receiving end of reading papers like, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder how they did that, or okay, I see how they did that. Okay, I, there's no way I can go about doing that. So, um, yeah, and I don't I don't think there's a, a easy answer because even if when you uh, I mean because sometimes we'll, we just uh, had a, a published a paper was like sharing some sort of aggregated Twitter data, uh, which we you know essentially we created a new data product. Uh, out of Twitter, uh, out of geotag Twitter data, um, which one solved issues with sort of privacy and all, all things like that, and two also we thought uh, our argument is it's it's no longer Twitter data; it's something we've done with Twitter data. And the terms of service we were working under said if you make a derivative product, that's okay. And so we you know sort of ran it that way, um, but it doesn't mean you know you know, well, we're not sharing that individual level data and I don't think we ever really will. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have an answer. Uh, maybe uh, Parvati has one. Uh, I don't have an, uh, a good answer for this either, but the way we kind of try to navigate uh, in, in, in epidemiology and mental health and health outcomes research is uh, to look at uh, so I'll give you an example. So I use a lot of uh, healthcare cost and utilization project data, HCUP data. These are provided by the government, a huge data files essentially. So if I were to purchase data set for let's say New York, emergency department data set, which is called the SED, S-E-D-D. It's a census of every single emergency department visit in, in New York, right? Uh, I cannot share these data. Uh, because, you know, these are given to me and then I have to maintain the way they are stored and who can access and it's a whole thing. But what I can do is go and look for HCUP's own summary files and see if my simple sort of aggregate numbers and the way I've aggregated things, let's say for substance use related emergency department visits, if they add up with government as estimates, right, show that. I completely support what Ryan said, like share the code. If you can't share the data set, share the code. That I think should be mandatory. We don't do that very well in epidemiology. I think the only field that does it, does it really well is e economics. And they make sure that if the data sets cannot be shared, the code can, right? And so whoever then has the money to buy the data set, you know, that, that we used, can it at least check if our work is good or not. The other is... <laughs> just you know thinking creatively about our descriptively our numbers across time or over place or by group consistent with other adjacent health outcomes so if i'm looking at substance use related emergency department visits is that consistent with reports other reports of substance use related mortality i mean those should be positively correlated at the very least right so in terms of maintaining data transparency like these kinds of uh, checks become important, even for us to believe our own findings, right? Forget about like showing transparency to the world, but that those should be like the starting steps. And I think developing, you know, protocols or just a general culture of did you cross, cross verify, you know, the way you aggregated data with some other data set, this sort of triangulation of uh, fundamental, you know, data distributions could be helpful. So Thank you so much. I mean, so the next question is related to a lot that you've been talking about. Um, Parvati, you, you just mentioned sort of who has the funds to sort of um, get the data, they can do it. And um, one thing I think earlier you talked about sort of thinking about, um, maybe it was Parvati, maybe it was Matthew about sort of accessing data sets. I think it was you Parvati about, you know, it used to be that the government was the sort of broker and that was sort of the source of the information. But now we have these other companies that have proprietary interests and in what data gets out. And um, so I was asking, I think I was thinking about this in terms of ownership, but I think that part of the ethical issues that is coming up in this conversation is also in terms of equity and access. Um, but on your view, does any one entity or individual own these large data sets? 
how should we think about ownership and its relationship to control? And how would that, how do data brokers fit into this picture um, and sort of the governance and structural challenges that they pose? So it's like, how do they, so one question is like, how did the data brokers fit in right now? And maybe ideally in the perfect world, like how should they be fitting in to these, um, to the sort of way in which data governance should be? That is such a great question. And I'll use an example of uh, this research by two uh, amazing economists. What they did was they examined the impact of the 2008 recession on uh, hospital visits for a certain number of causes like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, that kind of stuff. The way they measured, quote unquote, the 2008 recession was by looking at zip code level home foreclosure rates across multiple states. And zip code level home foreclosure data came from a uh, non sort of federal or state level, non-governmental sort of private, you know, real estate company, right? It was a very expensive data set. I know because I tried to purchase it and then I decided I, I, I couldn't, right? Those, those researchers were at Berkeley or somewhere else and they had the money. Uh, and that was my first exposure really as a PhD student to how the world works when it comes to these uh, expensive but highly detailed uh, informative data sets. Ideally, as a poor grad student, I would have wanted those data to be publicly available, but zip code level, uh, race specific, home foreclosure data are sensitive information. If I happen to be in that data set, I would not want other people to know, right? That that was my uh, condition. Or I, maybe I might, but I mean, it just, it just depends on the context, right? Uh, so I think hopefully there is a compromise halfway so that the incentives for uh, organizations who put in the money, like that real estate agency that put in the money to create that data set, right, are not discouraged from doing so. And at our end, you know, we build, you know, uh, systems or protocols where uh, there is in, there is there are enough incentives to form these sort of public private partnerships going forward. Um, but right now, where this sits is basically who you know, whether you have the funding, whether you have the right experts to draft that IRB statement, right? Um, and then how you use it. Uh, but this example sticks with me always. It was my very first experience. And uh, today, I think that, especially when we are talking now about more and more aspects of precision medicine, uh, aspects about, you know, more personalized treatments, those kinds of things, organizations that do have that information. Uh, I think it, it's a complicated problem to solve, but an interesting one of how to think about maintaining that, that, that process, huge investment in collecting and analyzing these data, but doing them the right way so that there is no breach of trust across the board. Um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in on one of the points that you made here, which is about, uh, you know, companies have interests when they put together these data sets and when they like, you know, utilize or, or spread these data sets because, um, you know, one thing that we always have trouble thinking about here is in, in some cases is like, what is it that the company is, what the company's business is and how that affects the data that we receive, right? Um, and this was something that we found kind of early on with using like Google data, right? That um, Google and other, you know, um, as well as, you know, Twitter and all these others, they've got a business model and their business model isn't providing data to um, social science researchers. Um, they're trying to get people to use their search algorithm more. They're trying to get people to post more, engage more. And so um, a lot of times the data that we're treating as kind of given to us from above, 
you know, this is the whole population data that we've got. The, it's actually data that can be very unstable and um, change because of the because of the interests of the the companies that are that are generating this. Um, and so I think that that is something that is, um, you know, we, we always have to keep in mind. There are a lot of these things that we've just got to, you know, I, I think Matthew's right, where you've got to stop and be more critical with it. Um, you know, one of the most famous examples of a big data set in the healthcare field gone wrong was one which was to try and basically help triage patients. And as it's dependent variable, it was using subsequent spending on a health condition. Um, and it turned out that subsequent spending varies, you know, all other things being equal, varies pretty dramatically by race. And so because they were looking at severity in terms of spending, their algorithm ended up becoming biased. And so it's just, it's really important to think through, like, how is this data generated? What's the data generating process? How has that changed? What is this data? What does it mean? All these kinds of things are just become hugely important. I just want to follow up with that, because I mean, I, I mean, this is I think we've all sort of dealt with this, but I mean, both uh, the sort of the dynamism, I, I'll, I sometimes I talk, I talk about sometimes uh, big data being kind of brittle. Uh, it's like it's there. But then something changes and suddenly it's no longer available or something or the I mean, like, well, like the, like the Google flu data. I mean, that's like, you know, the, the classic, you know, it's suddenly but it changed to it changed to meaning something else. Um, and so there's this brittleness to this, but there's also, um, you know, one of the, the effects I see with like the like getting getting data from data brokers, it's it also can be sort of a useful black box. Um, because since you're not, um, collecting yourself, you don't know all the warts and all the sort of problems with it. You sort of get, you get sort of a limited kind of thing and you're like, okay, that's what we know. And if you, you usually don't get much, you, even if you ask, you don't get m more details on that. Um, and so you're sort of trusting it, but at one, at some level, that's actually kind of nice because then you're like, well, okay, it's, it's, it, I'll take what it is and I'll work with it. Um, and we'll see what come up, comes up with it, which, I mean, it's sort of human beings. It's sort of how reason. I mean, I, I understand. I mean, I've done it myself in some ways, you know, as well. But at the same time, uh, because it's sort of a, a black box and hidden, uh, it does mean it's hard to do that interrogation of it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask one final question, and then there's a bunch of questions in the Q and A from the audience. So I want to give the opportunity to talk about those as well. But the last question is um, also has already been touched upon, um, but. Um, one of the things that Ryan just mentioned was the um, the the business models of the entities that are collecting this data. And I want to flip the question and think about, you know, the the people, as Matthew was talking about, like data are humans, like the people that are the ones that are creating these data, right? And uh, much of the data that's been collected, even when it is publicly available, was not collected for research purposes. And how should we think about the origins of these data? Does the use of these data sets change our conception more broadly about informed consent to research? What should we do about it, guys? Um, so I don't know if anyone wants to jump in first. Um, maybe Matthew, do you want to go first and then? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll jump in because I mean I will say that I I mean one of the things I you know still get grad grad students who like will be like how could you use that Twitter data you collected because it was never it was not put out there with that that intent, um, and yeah and, and that's that's something I've definitely sort of struggled with. I mean I think there's a couple ways you know ways to do it and and, and I and my guess, I'm going back to like sort of thinking critically and carefully about this these sorts of things and and so it's you know for for in my turn of my own use using you know geotag social media you know we're focused on sort of locational kinds of questions we're not focused on on uh, sort of content kinds of questions if we're trying to use like you know home location we you know, if you know, we're trying to estimate home location, we do it at sort of an aggregate level rather than an individual sort of how you know, sort of you know, housing, and we never present the results at sort of a at, at a way that is individually specific. I mean, those those are ways that we get at that. That doesn't really solve the you know the the, the question you really ask is like, can we reuse this data if it's not been done by informed consent? Um, and I yeah, so I mean. 
I guess part of my answer is I think, and obviously by my actions, I, I have. So I guess I think I will have to say I think we can if we're careful about it and thoughtful about it. But I'm not I don't want to say that that gets me a get out of jail free card. I mean, I think there's you know, there's I'm still you know, there's still definitely some issues that I worry about on this. I know there are some uh, people have explored sort of automating informed consent, you know, that you can have sort of like sort of settings in your, you know, in your, your browser and things like that. That has some possibility. I have a feeling it's going to be like terms or service or the GDPR thing where you just click accept all kinds of thing. And I don't think that really moves the needle that much. So I'll, I'll stop right there. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, this is super tough. There's a, there's a lot of questions about, you know, who can or who, who should control the data. Um, you know, there are ideas floating out there for giving people, um, you know, basically a stake in their own data. So um, where they get paid for the, the data and how it's used as a proportion. Of, um, and it's just tough to figure out, you know, who, I mean, at this point right now are, idea is that the people who own it are the people who collected it and whatever means they use to do it. Um, but this results in some scary stuff. I mean, as scholars, we try to keep things, you know, general and stuff like that. But I can tell you, I have seen the data in some of these market, like micro targeting firms. It is scary what they know about you, like um, even in their demonstration stuff. They know how many pets you have, like what your purchasing habits are. Like they know things about you that your spouse probably doesn't, right? Um, and so, yeah, and everything we've come up with in a lot of cases really seems to come into like this terms of service kind of situation, which is... Yeah, that can't be the answer because we found terms of service, nobody reads them, nobody. And, and so I don't know what the answer is. Um, all I know is that uh, yeah, something needs to probably be done that's not terms of service in this area. Uh, yeah, Ryan's example and a discussion and Matthew's too, just, I just remembered this one paper that I read, which is kind of amazing. They looked at uh, big data by like basically scraping uh, Amazon uh, during the early days of the pandemic and uh, somehow figured out a way to use the big data and analyze the text for complaints against Yankee candles not smelling. And turns out it coincided with the wave of the COVID-19 pandemic where a lot of people were infected. And so that was, you know, basically a marker of like how the population couldn't smell uh now the were the people asked like whose reviews were scraped uh, about being a part of that study uh i don't know uh, and that is i think not even as sensitive of an information mm -hmm. compared to like people who uh, are included in electronic health records data mm -hmm. uh i take comfort in saying that it's the federal government that i'm getting the data from but that's all, th that's the only defense I have really uh, to sort of, you know, get on with research and, and not really sp spend the required time in really thinking about this uh, because we also have to push research forward. Uh, similarly with mortality data or birth data, uh, vital records data or any other data sets. So I don't have a good answer for that at all. Uh, but I would just, I think by pushing the conversation forward, I think we can make it better, I guess, right? To let people know that there are these ways that your data could be used. I don't know. I mean, my worry is that if it's not done right, it'll harm mm -hmm. research efforts or even simple like healthcare management and policy making efforts. But yeah. what is the best way of doing it? I don't know. Well, I'm hearing from all three of you, you guys are being really hard on yourself, but I'm hearing actual individual methods that each of you have used to really think both critically and like proactively about protecting the individual data. Um, and um, I mean, one thing that is interesting from, you know, reading, like 
people are very open to having their data being used for research purposes when you ask them that, right? And so there is a sort of way of thinking about the alignment of research ends with the sort of data that people are creating, providing, but really thinking about the connect between ensuring public trust and ensuring protection seems like a really important like thread. Um, uh, so I'm gonna jump into some of the questions from the audience that I think are really interesting and important. So one question um, is from Kelsey Badger, who's um, the data science librarian at Ohio State, um, says, I appreciate the thoughtful discussion of how to more ethically engage with big data. I'm curious under what circumstances you personally would not use a particular big data source due to ethical considerations. If there's, if there have been any red lines in your, um, in the past or have, have you thought about it? At some point, uh, maybe 10 plus years ago, there was some, um, uh, one of like the, the founders of a online dating website had run across some of my work and was like really sort of excited about it. And we had a few conversations, uh, but ultimately decided not to sort of explore, uh, explore it too deeply because it just, I think, uh, well, there were a couple, a couple concerns. And, but at some, sometimes that kind of, that kind of data, I actually thought it was like a fascinating kind of potential project, and I suspect they probably did it internally uh, to, to some extent, different sets of questions, more sort of, you know, profit making kinds of things. But at that time, I just was like, I just uh, didn't want to, um, didn't, didn't feel right. Uh, we'd also done like sort of like trying to look at sort of differences in people taking selfies of each other or taking selfies of themselves and how that varied across it was a different cultures of selfies and things like that. And we sort of, I sort of did that before that. And that one felt a little invasive because we ended up like looking at a lot of like, you know, people's selfies posted on, on social media. Um, but that was more just sort of a personal, like it didn't feel, wasn't something I was interested in doing. I'm not sure if I would say that was a hard and fast rule. Um, I think you could, I think you could do that thoughtfully and well, but it wasn't something that I wanted to do at that time. Yeah, yeah. This is a a tough one. I'm I'm trying to think of a time when I like refused to use a data source. I I think some of it has to also do with like the the end use and the end user. Um, so yeah, you know, one of the projects that I've been on that um you know kind of had some sticky ethical implications was uh, one to predict uh, where protests were going to be and what kinds of protests. I mean, obviously something very interest for, interesting for a social scientist and specifically for someone who studied some international relations. But on the other hand, you do kind of wonder what will this be utilized for? Because we were predicting in places like Venezuela. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, not so much turning down a data source as much as like really, really questioning what um, what kind of use it's put to and how and how that ends up being, I guess, utilized outside of the research area, research project. Um, I yeah. So Ryan explained that beautifully. Uh, in the past, when I used to work in India with the World Bank, that's when I would run into some issues of like, how would this be used? Like, would this be used for, I don't know, categorizing like who gets a certain conditional cash transfer versus who doesn't? So that's that's when I had to sort of recuse myself from, you know, utilizing you know, and uh, essentially like working on those kinds of projects. But other than that, in the US, I have not had such an experience yet. That is really fascinating. Thank you for sharing those um, responses. Like the the downstream uses of one's like research outputs is a thorny topic, but it's often something that is like really hard to regulate or think about, right? In terms of um, proactive measures. And so maybe one follow up question um, is something that we've sort of touched upon, but we haven't focused so much on is this possible the possible collective harms and also downstream like um 
also collected benefits of the use of um, big data sources. So um, uh, research conducted on large data sets um, really have both individual and group harms and benefits to the research. And are there ways in which you think about group interests when it comes to approaching your own research? Um, I can go first. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's just such limited data sets or surveillance systems for population level mental health outcomes that I think uh, real time, you know, Twitter data, which can help us with sentiment analysis, or even there have been studies where mention of opioid overdoses on Twitter sort of coincided with opioid mortality hotspots, right? That kind of work on aggregate at the population level, which can tell us real time instead of waiting for data to come out later, right, would be very useful, I think, for responding right away to, uh, you know, emergent situations. Um, but if, like Rand was mentioning, if these data are used in a way to target communities, anticipate, you know, where there are going to be protests or where there's going to be um, a, a, something else that, that has sort of, you know, divisive connotations, uh, which there, there are so many documentaries about this of how like Facebook data were used to target. So that then is the harm, uh, which we wake up to much later. So, and I, I don't have a good answer for that, but I think in terms of just at least trying to understand, you know, the population level implications in terms of pattern recognition and uh, real time forecasting of uh, sensitive health outcomes, identifying certain disease outbreaks or, or mortality or overdose clusters, it could be very useful. Yeah, so I mean, this is a, you know, big question, like, that's just shot through the entire area of big data and AI, um, which is this um, one, one particular variant of this is the idea of individual harm group benefit. So let's take, for example, the training data that we utilize for creating large language models and everything like that, right? In in theory, this could be a big, you know, social benefit, right? These large language models that can do so much, improve so many different things of what we do, or at least the, you know, the companies are going to say a big benefit, right? Um, but it comes at a cost to individual, like, privacy and ownership, Um you know, the, the number of artists or photographers who have had their material be utilized without any kind of compensation in creating these, um, in creating these. And, and this comes up in, in healthcare. When I teach uh, politics and ethics of AI, I bring this to my students about, you know, how much benefit can you generate by linking up all kinds of health records and genetic data and all kinds of the social benefits to potentially preventing and treating disease are there, but they might come at a cost of individual level, um, individual data privacy loss, um, even you know, changing individual level care, not always maybe in the way that is, you know, helpful to, you know, th this is where you get into the, the question of, you know, improving group outcomes versus, you know, ensuring that all individuals have a, a minimum level of income, which I think is an, an area that really needs, to, like in bioethics, it's certain really needs to be explored, because I've already seen, for example, in MD Anderson, where they're, training their AI predictions such that it doesn't maximize health, but it m minimizes the difference between group outcomes, which is, you know, good that they're thinking. I, it's great that they're thinking about this in this way, um, but also it's something that is, um, it's a thorny issue. Uh, it's it, the ethics there are really are really fraught. Um, so, yeah. I'd just like to add one more thing to what Ryan yeah. said, which 
kind of got me thinking. I think that being very intentional and cautious about which group level outcomes, you know, are amenable to to the use of uh, uh, big data and AI mechanisms and which are not. Because what Ryan describes, right, that people often attempt to do, which is classical ecological fallacy, is use group level information to make individual level decisions. And so, like, having safeguards against exactly that and declaring at the outset the way we have to do for registering randomized control trials is that this is the outcome that we're going to look at for these reasons, for this group benefit, and that's it. And whether it's amenable if this that are using big data and AI methods and machine learning models is even the right way for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to hop on real quick. I mean, I think you know, I love both the responses you all had. Um, I think, you know, for me, it's and it's it, it's sort of a bigger question than just academia. I mean, it's like we can like sort of control what we do, but there are plenty of you know you know companies and you know people who are doing it for specific kinds of things. I mean, one of the things I've always you know thought I've thought about a lot recently are these like ten weeks sort of boot camps to become a data scientist, and which you sort of learn you know fifteen different algorithms that you can use in data, and then off off you go with probably no ethical oversight and probably not that much understanding of what's actually happening with those algorithms. Um, this reminds me of this uh, one paper I like uh, uh, quite a bit done by a colleague in my department. I was looking at poli uh, predictive policing and it had a lot more to do with like how the police on the ground were actually, you know, doing their, their sort of, they, they sort of found a way to, uh, to keep doing what they wanted to do anyway. And one of the quotes uh, from that was like, it almost makes no difference what predictive algorithm you use, the effects on the ground are the same. So, I mean, I don't wanna say that we shouldn't think about these sort of topics, but at the same time, it's uh, the, 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 the policy about how this stuff puts, gets put into use is where, um, we, you know, where it really matters, I think. Or we, sh we shouldn't forget that. I won't say it doesn't matter the other parts. Yeah, I mean, as as a uh, political scientist, um, de <laughs> definitely endorse that that these do get put into real world areas, um, and like the design of the uh, of bureaucratic accountability and all these other things, really does matter because when you start getting into uh, you know what the accountability means in um, in these contexts, it, it can get really difficult. Well, thank you so much, Matthew, Ryan, and Parvati for a deep and critical conversation. Um, uh, really, you opened a lot of questions um, and continued the conversation um, at Ohio State. Um, so I thank you for that. For those that are um, joining us today, um, please join us for our final care panel of the semester on December 2nd on the ethics of conducting research in um, war and conflict settings. Um, and I hope to see you all soon in another conversation about research ethics. Thank you all. Thanks so much for organizing. It was fine. It was a, it was a great conversation. Glad to have a chance to meet everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This is great. Have a good yeah. one. Bye.